Hello and welcome to the On the Couch podcast, the podcast that gives you the view from the therapist chair. I'm your host, John Dennis, a licensed professional counselor. You're listening to OTC episode 47 with Sydney Jensen, the 2019 Nebraska Teacher of the Year. Hello again, OTC listeners. Welcome back to another episode. Thank you for stopping by and checking us out. So uh, just going to be real honest, um, you know, it's been an odd summer, to say the least. <laughs> and I think we can all agree to that. Um, we are just blazing through summer. We're into August now, um, which means in just a few short weeks, uh, a lot of the country is going to be going back to school um, in some form, ideally. Uh, obviously, some school districts uh, have already started back. Um, people are making decisions based off of their school districts or their college and the, and the different options that they have uh, for education this fall. And, I mean, it, it's obviously... Um, you know, we didn't get a chance to recharge this summer the way a lot of us normally do. And I, I, I know that's really taking a toll on a lot of people. And then we turn right back around and we're being asked to make really difficult, important decisions and go into, a, a, you know, a, a school year that we've, we've never faced something like this before. And it's, it's affecting everyone, you know, anyone that has a student or works with a school, you know, administration, teachers, students, parents, uh, staff, it's, it's kind of hitting on every level. And I, I had an opportunity to catch up with Sydney Jensen, who uh, she was the 2019 Nebraska Teacher of the Year, and she did a TED Talk specifically focusing on the mental and emotional well-being of teachers and just the importance of that. And so from, from my background, I, I love teachers. I I. I have a special connection with teachers. Uh, my father was a, a woodshop teacher for 30 plus years. And I, I don't know, I just always admired him and, and uh, the impact that he had in my life and, and my brother's life, but also uh, just all of the students that he came in contact with. Uh, there was... We used to joke that you couldn't go anywhere without running into somebody that that he knew. Either he taught them, he taught their parents, he worked with them. You know, it was something. And um, you know, teaching is is just such a such a noble profession, so important for our country. Obviously, as we've seen over the last six months, um, you know, we've been on this roller coaster ride where, you know. I think everybody came to really appreciate what teachers deal with as we were having to sort of teach from home. And, and then that shifted over the summer and, and towards the end here of like, you got to take my kids, they got to go back to school. And, you know, it, this conversation with Sydney, I actually recorded before, uh, like, I think, two to three weeks before all of you know the COVID quarantine really kicked off. So we actually didn't didn't talk about that. It wasn't on our radar in the the conversation that we had, but it, it definitely applies now more than ever, I think, that you know, we need to support our teachers. And that idea that they are they are doing a very hard job um, and they are not just teachers. They wear so many different hats and do so much more than, you know, just teach. And I think we're, we're finding out firsthand that, you know, the, the inner workings of our society and our system all play into one another. And for us to be able to work, our students have to 
have teachers. They have to have education. They have to have, you know, a place that they can go or a, a program that they can log into and be a part of. And for that to happen, we also have to care for our teachers and uh, teachers have to learn how to care for themselves also. And that's going to be of supreme importance, <laughs> you know, the utmost importance this school year of all years. Um, you know, for any teachers that, that may be listening, I would, I would highlight some of the things that we talk about in this interview of, you know, finding either a mentor or some accountability, uh, you know, one other teacher or maybe a small pod, like group of teachers that you're staying connected and really checking in on one another on, no, how are you actually doing, you know, being real and um, learning together on, you know, what's working and what's not working. I would definitely say looking into any EAP, uh, Employee Assistance Program, that you may have through your benefits. Um, Now is the time. Uh, Teletherapy is is widely accessible. It It is really opened the doors to make mental health services accessible to just about everybody, if not everybody. Um, And I would strongly encourage any teacher or administrator to really take a look at that and and access that. I I know uh, a lot of therapists also are really hesitant to, to, prior to teletherapy uh, really opening up, were hesitant to reach out uh, for services for themselves because of the idea of, well, I don't, I'm not going to be able to drive, you know, an hour out of my area to go see somebody for an hour in session and I don't want to meet with somebody in my town because of the impact that that, that may have or the way I may be viewed or, or things like that. And with teletherapy, it's really changed and, and made access um, to somebody across the state uh, that is not anywhere near your, your area much, much more easy. Um, so I would definitely encourage that. The other is one thing that I've been talking with folks about is think of your mental health as your cell phone battery charge, you know, the percentage of charge that you have. And, you know, right now it's like mid August. Where would you put that charge and how much can you recharge it? before the school year starts? And and if you're listening to this afterwards, just yeah. After the school year has started, how much can you keep it charged? Can you maintain that? Or can you raise that up at all? What are the coping skills that you have that help do that? And how much do they raise that charge? And I think at at the very least, really aiming for maintaining the charge so that it really doesn't dip down too much. You know, I know we've all had that experience where we forgot to plug in our cell phone overnight or something like that. And and you wake up to, you know, low power mode where your battery charge is is down below 20 percent or 10 percent or whatever. And it it just doesn't hold a charge the way that it normally does when it's when your battery is run down. And the same for us. We we really need that. It's it is shaping up to be a potentially uh, very difficult year, a uh, lot of stressors. I know a lot of teachers are, are being asked to bend over backwards and uh, basically work two jobs where they're teaching in person and teaching uh, like a high flex, um, you know, synchronous or asynchronous teaching model. And they're just being asked to, to do things that we've never asked them to do before. And I would say for any any parents out there, and I have to remind myself of this also, is they're trying to do the best that they can. We are all trying to do the best that we can with the the decisions, the options that we have before us. We're trying to really pick the least worst option a lot of times in terms of education in this this COVID era. 
And so I would really stress for any any parents listening to also try to bear that in mind. Um, um, so with with Sydney, uh, what I think will come through is just all that she has learned in her experience in her own teaching career and having some of that accountability and mentorship and through her experience of being nominated as a, a teacher of the year and, um, you know, just the experiences that she had off of that, um, you know, that idea that, um, she talks in the interview about the concept of uh, marigold versus a walnut. And I think especially for teachers that applies, you know, the idea of marigolds uh, are, are like super pollinators. They, they really help uh, with the growth of plants and vegetables and flowers, and whereas walnut trees uh, kind of kill everything. In a, in a certain radius. And that idea that as a teacher, you want to plant yourself near marigolds. You want to find other teachers, other administrators, other staff, and, and other people outside of that that are supports that do support you and help you grow. And I, I think the same could be said for all of us, really. Um, but Specifically, I think, for, for teachers uh, in the coming months. If you want to learn more about Sydney and find out about her TED Talk or see what she's up to, you can catch her at her website, which is sydney-jensen.com. So S-Y-D-N-E-Y-J-E-N-S-E-N.com. I'm so privileged to have on the On the Couch podcast tonight uh, Sydney Jensen, who is the 2019 Nebraska Teacher of the Year, and she is a ninth grade English high school teacher at Lincoln High School. So, Sydney, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I was really, really thrilled we were able to put this together. Uh, after I you know, kind of caught wind of your your TED talk, I was like, yeah, okay, let's, I got to figure out a way to make this happen. So, yeah. So how'd you get into teaching? I mean, was that like, you, you knew from like, you know, young, you know, <laughs> no, <laughs> I think that's like the, the nice story that so many people have is like that they grew up, you know, teaching the ABCs to their stuffed animals. Um, but that is not really true for me. Okay. Um, I thought I would be a pharmacist cause I worked at a pharmacy in high school, but, um, it turns out I like can barely add, so <laughs> that wasn't, mm -hmm. wasn't going to work out, um, for me at all. Uh, and really like when I think back on it now, the thing that I really loved about working at a pharmacy, it was locally owned, um, in where I grew up in Eatonton, Georgia. Um, I just really loved the community. Okay. Of it. And <laughs> yeah. It, it sort of makes sense now looking back. Um, but no, I, when I was in college, I didn't really know what I wanted to be doing. And I ended up working Oof. at a summer camp as a camp counselor. And that's sort of where I figured out that I wanted to be a teacher. I had this sort of like epiphany moment, I guess. Um, I was counseling this group of like 10 11 year old girls and we walked by the pond in the middle of camp and there was this turtle digging a hole to lay eggs in and i don't know anything about turtles but we thought it was really cool <laughs> there you go and so we like we like found a book about turtles in the nature lodge and we camped out there all night watching this mom and turtle do it and i was like I can't teach science but <laughs> i really love working with kids and learning with kids mm -hmm. um that was really fun to like find this thing that we were curious about and follow it together. And just like the excitement of then sharing that with the other people who would walk by other campers. We were like, guys, you have to see what's happening. Let me tell you all these turtle facts. I now know, <laughs> uh, was really cool. And so I got back to university of Georgia after that first summer at camp and I changed my major, um, to English education. <laughs> now it's kind of that. <laughs> now, how far, how far in were you when you switched the major? 
Oh, it was my junior <laughs> year. Um, nice. So yeah, so it extended my stay uh, at UGA by a year, which I think was what <laughs> I needed anyway. Sure. And <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, I've never looked back. I mean, I think that like, um, I found my purpose. It just took a little bit. Yeah. But now I can't imagine doing anything else. Well, and I mean, yeah, like you said, sure, the, you know, teaching the ABCs to the stuffed animals is cute. And yeah, obviously some people have that. Yeah, I knew from early on, like I, so my, my father was a, a woodshop teacher for like 30 plus years. So I, I have like a special place in my heart for teachers and administration. And I always kind of knew growing up that like, yeah, I was either going to be like a, a teacher, a coach or a counselor. Like that was pretty much, I, I knew it was going to be somewhere in there. Um, but that idea of, you know, working with high schoolers, obviously, you know, once they hit junior year, there's that like huge pressure of like, you have to figure out your entire life. And so I would imagine your story is pretty helpful for that of like, yeah, Hey, yeah, you don't have to have it all figured out. You'll, you'll get there. <laughs> yep. Wow. That's awesome. A bit of time. So how did you then get into like TED Talks and like all of this? <laughs> That's such a great question. And I still don't necessarily really. Have a <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I got here. Um, so I guess it sort of started with Nebraska Teacher of the Year. Um, one of my colleagues nominated me for that. And that was like a crazy process. And I found myself in it, um, which was really amazing and led to a lot of really cool experiences. Um, yeah. One of the best things about being a state teacher of the year is getting to build this cohort along with the other 2019 stories. Um, that's been really amazing. And we have these opportunities to come together as a group and learn w from and with one another. And one of those opportunities was last February. So February 2019, we all came together at Google headquarters in California. And that's the first time that we met. Wow. And we did this. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, it was sort of a conference setup. And one of the sessions was on storytelling. Hmm. And as an English teacher, I really consider myself to be a storyteller. Um, I use it a ton in teaching. And uh, the person leading it was just so dynamic and great. And so she went through like this whole storytelling thing. And then she gave us 10 minutes to go off and she was like, write a true story from your classroom. Um, and after 10 minutes, we'll come back together. We'll take some volunteers to share and we'll give some feedback on those stories. And so I did it. And honest to God, in my head, I thought like, I'm going to raise my hand, but if I don't get called on first, then I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone here is so amazing. And you really like, you know, size yourself up compared to these like educational giants that you're surrounded by. And I was like, I'm not following that. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Like it's a no for me, dog. And I raised my hand and I got called on first. And so I was like, okay, well here it goes. And I told my story, um, about failing to reach one of my kids and mm. how I messed it up. Um, and after that, a uh, person came up to me. I had no idea that people from Ted were in the room. <laughs> they oh, <were> <laughs> surprise. <laughs> right. Cause like, you know, you're, you're there. It's like day one, you don't know anyone. And so yeah. who are any of these people? <laughs> they just have like a little name card and yeah, <laughs> lanyard. <laughs> right. um, and they were, I didn't know, but they were actually going to be presenting next about uh, their Ted Ed channel. Um, that has like all these cool animations you can use in your classroom and stuff. Wow. And so they happened to be in the room and heard my story. And uh, one of the guys came up to me and was like, hey, I'm from Ted. I just sent you an email. <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you should take that. No pressure should, or anything. <laughs> and you should like, you should turn it into a Ted proposal. Um, and wow. so I did. I worked on it. I like, they have this really cool masterclass app um, that sort of takes you through the process hmm. of creating a Ted talk and, you know, all the nuance to that. And I submitted it and then I found out I was selected to like go through the process of being coached and all of that. Um, and so all that really started in February and I didn't record it until mid October. <laughs> so it was a pretty 
lengthy process. Um, I don't know if I have worked that hard on any one thing in my entire life. Wow. Okay. But, yeah. But uh, I mean, I think it was that it's a topic that really matters to me that I care a whole lot about. I put a lot of pressure on myself to do justice by it. Mm. Um, and I hope I did. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm assuming if they, <laughs> if they were like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's been, it's been really wild. Um, but the talk, it focuses on mental wellness supports for teachers, uh, especially the idea of secondary trauma that uh -huh. like you can't walk through water without getting wet. <laughs> and yep. so as a teacher, when we are pouring ourselves into students who come from intense trauma at home, um, outside of school in whatever capacity, uh, I serve the most diverse high school in the state of Nebraska. Um, a lot of people don't know this. It's really interesting. Um, Nebraska is uh, a huge hub for refugee students. Okay. Um, we're one of the top five cities for refugee resettlement in the country. Wow. And so we, yeah, we have over 30 different languages spoken by the families that we serve at Lincoln High. And so with that, I have a lot of students who have come to Lincoln High from refugee camps, um, from places in the world that are just being absolutely torn apart with violence. Um, and then, you know, you have those other types of trauma where it's emotional abuse or physical abuse at home, um, not having needs met in terms of housing, uh, food, proper care, yeah. um, those sorts of things. And as an English teacher, I read a ton of their writing and it's really impossible not to know about those things that are happening, but it's also really heavy to not be able to change those things for our kids. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, that's really what the talk is about that need for social and emotional and mental wellness supports, not just for students and not just for teachers, but for both. Um, and I don't think that a lot of districts are providing that at this point, which is, I mean, on the one end, like I wouldn't say not surprising, but like, you know, I always say, like, I think, you know, mental health is starting to come into its heyday where it's getting a lot of airplay and people are starting to get on board. But then some of the nuts and bolts of like, OK, how do you actually do that? And, sure. you know, certain um, certain pockets of our society are getting more. Uh, attention, like, you know, you think of military or f sometimes first responders after 9-11 or things like that. And th there's different areas that, that are kind of lagging. Um, and yeah, just the, um, that idea of like, we didn't even, you know, you, we're not even talking like primary trauma of like your own stuff, <laughs> like, you know, your own relationship or your own, you know, upbringing or whatever you're dealing with, like, um, and, and to kind of share of my story, um, so I, I have, uh, two kids and one of them's in, in elementary school. And I was thinking about that today and just preparing to talk to you of like, you know, if, if my daughter has had like a crappy morning and she's like a crying mess and I put her on the school bus, I'm usually, you know, firing off a text message to the teacher through the, you know, school approved like communication app of like, hey, just a heads up, like, you know, my daughter's a mess. Good luck. <laughs> like, <laughs> just in case she, yeah. she like, loses it in class, this is what's going on. Um, and just the idea of, like, the teacher could be getting, like, however many students there are in the class, they could be getting that many messages that morning of, like, hey, just a heads up, <laughs> you might have a meltdown, um, like, 30 times or, you know, 20 or whatever it is. Um for sure. Yeah. And there's some research on that. Um, so I've been reading uh, this book on mindfulness in the classroom. Um, and it's literally called Mindfulness in the Classroom. <laughs> it very, came out, very subtle. Good. <laughs> yeah, <was> very subtle. <laughs> it came out last year through ASCD. And it talks about this, um, this Gallup study that they did in 2014 where they found that um, teachers ranked last in a survey of 12 occupational groups, like, you know, high population occupational groups. When asked if they felt their opinions counted in the workplace, they counted last. Wow. <laughs> uh, 
That same study found that 46% of teachers reported high daily stress during the school year, which tied with nurses for the highest stress rate as an occupational hazard. So like research exists to say that teaching is really, really hard and stressful, but there's not so much research on um, the impact specifically of secondary trauma and what that does to teacher retention. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the frustrating things is that like, I think that to be able to provide adequate supports to teachers, it it's going to cost money. Like everything, sure. <laughs> everything has, you know, a bottom line. Yep. And the other thing about it is you think of rural areas. Oh yeah. Where those mental health professionals maybe don't exist in mass in those specific yeah. territories. And so then what do you do when you're talking about like, I mean, over here, Western Nebraska is pretty sparsely populated um, that is not to say that those students and those teachers aren't experiencing trauma or secondary trauma. No, not at all. But yeah, but are there people available, you know, in that geographic area who are licensed professionals, trained professionals to be able to help with those sorts of things? And the answer is like, I don't really know, but I could make a guess Yeah. Um, that not so much. Mm-hmm. And there's been, so there's, it's HR 2544. Okay. Um, the Teacher Health and Wellness Act, but it has literally been sitting in <laughs> Congress doing nothing since 2017. And all it 2017. does is it asks, yes, it asks for funding to be allocated to do research on teacher health and wellness. Wow. Uh, and I think like that research has to happen. There has to be funding for it to happen yeah. before any sort of federal level or even state level, uh, is going to say, here's money towards, um, addressing this, this problem. And I think until that happens, we're going to continue to see like pretty high teacher turnover just because of teachers experiencing, you know, we call it burnout. I don't know if that's fair. Uh, (laughs) Um, I would, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, in, in mental health, I mean, sometimes when talking about the secondary trauma and the compassion fatigue and things like that of like, you're, you're getting crispy. Like you're just getting burnt. For sure. For sure. For myself, sometimes I hear that word burnout and I I don't like, I think (laughs) that there's like a connotation to it of, you know, like I'm sick of my job and that's not it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, and and for some, it's like, man, this job would be great if it wasn't for the, you know, fill in the blank of like, some that's the administration they're dealing with, some that's the parents, some that's the kids, some that's the colleagues, some, you know, yeah. And yeah, I, I, so I spent time uh, in Virginia on uh, the Eastern Shore, uh, which was a very rural area and not not a lot of services and, and resources. And I, I remember the one principal for the elementary school, the, the story goes that he would, uh, you know, as the teachers were coming in for the school year and like getting their rooms ready and doing the teacher in services, like one of the things he would do is like get a school bus. He would drive the bus and put them all on it and drive them through the neighborhoods that a lot of these kids were were living in and just, you know, to hammer home the concept of like this is what your kids are coming with every day. This is where they're coming from. This is where they're going home. And, you know, I think you talked about in, in the Ted talk, like they may not be getting breakfast. They may not, you know, like some kids are playing the condiment game with their refrigerator of like, who can make the funnest meal out of, you know, relish and mayonnaise and God knows what else is in there. Um, or the, yeah, the, the abuse, the, the things like that. And, um, I mean, again, we haven't even we haven't even touched on like you know mass casualty events or, or things like that. So, um, so can you kind of speak to what do you think are some of the factors that have led to some of this? Yeah. So when I kind of reflect on it, I think one of the things is that in a lot of ways the expectations of teachers have changed. Hmm. Um. I'm You're saying the crazy. expectations the teachers have themselves or that the society has for the teachers? 
I think both that society has for teachers and the way that just like best practices in education have changed because of changes in society. Okay. So like, so I, I'm yes. pretty early in my career. <laughs> like, I turn thirty next month, um, <laughs> which is exciting. Uh, <laughs> like, I have not been in the game, you know, a terribly long time. Sure. Uh, but you but, said in the TED talk, like you're not, you're no first year teacher. Like you're not like you know for sure. straight out yeah. of school. This is year eight. Um, so, but, but when I think about like the change in the way that education operates over time, um, you know, like technology has changed things substantially in the classroom. Yeah. Um, but they've also changed things in the workforce. And that's like another thing I talk about in the, in the talk is like, you know, we're not, we're not creating students, uh, who are going to graduate from high school and they're going to go stand online in a line on a factory, Mm -hmm. you know? There, it's not about rote memorization and repetitive action anymore because we have computers and machinery that does all that. And it's only going to keep getting worse in terms of those jobs are disappearing in mass. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we need kids who can go out and they can be problem solvers and critical thinkers and relationship builders. And so a lot of what we're doing in the classroom has to shift to that instead of just, you know, like, drilling them with spelling words and and fast facts that they're like going through it's got to be more focused on that critical thinking piece Mm. and be able to do things like that creates opportunities for communication in a classroom that weren't maybe at the forefront of lesson planning 20 or 30 years ago okay and i think that 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 element of added communication um, is something that, uh, has in a lot of ways made the depth of a relationship that a student and a teacher can have really different Mm -hmm. (laughs) where it's not necessarily just that I'm, you know, reading the five paragraph essay you're required to, were required to write for me. Like instead you're creating your own, you know, way of showing me your learning. Like my kids are doing a research project right now and I, as a personal opinion, think research papers are super lame. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a, a couple of ninth grade English students who would probably agree with you. <laughs> right? And, and so they're sort of designing their own project. It's like you're going to research something that you think is interesting and you decide how you're going to communicate to me that you've met these objectives, you know, to, to be able to find information and analyze it for credibility and synthesize it, you know, into into something that's your own. And so I have kids who are like making podcasts. And so I'm like working with them on the technology piece and what does a podcast sound like and that kind of stuff. And that is just such a different level of partnership between teacher and student than like, hey, here's an outline, write me a five paragraph essay on William Shakespeare or something, you know? And so I think just like through those interactions, you get to know students on such a different level now (laughs) when when that's the focus um and that has made it where i think we are just as teachers more aware of what's happening in our students lives outside of our classroom walls Mm -hmm. and so that's the first piece that i think makes it really like potent (laughs) um uh the other thing is like i don't know i just i really think that technology has changed the way that kids view adults Mm. even especially like in high school I don't know I kids interact with their teachers at Lincoln High in a way that when I reflect on like my time in a classroom I don't know if that was ever true for me um and so I think that that's interesting as well. I forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> well, no, no. Uh, I was going to respond about that of like you're saying um, you think it makes the teachers more accessible because, you know, you've got some teachers that are on TikTok. They're, they're, they have the profiles or things like that. And so it, it, um, it's not this like very drastic – you know, I, you think of like college professor – Mm-hmm. and student like that, the, the separation there, well, ideally anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, or, or I, maybe the, um, like, um, uh, British boarding school concept mm-hmm. is, is like closer to what I'm going for of like, you would never dare like 
spend time with them or like talk to them in ways that a lot of teachers get talked to today here. Um, so, and I mean, with that technology comes the electronic grading, which I know a lot of people are, <laughs> some people love and some people are like, oh my gosh, it's awful. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. With what you're talking about, I I mean, do you think we need to get away from statewide benchmark kind of uh, standards? And I know uh, you hear a lot of that of like, they're just teaching to this test. It's not, right. you know, we need to stop that. But then nobody ever seems to have an answer for how to like do that. Yeah. And I think that's like, I don't know, the pendulum constantly swings. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a conversation about that today with someone actually where, you know, there was frustration of like, you're looking at a grade book and it's like, why is this kid failing? They're missing one assignment. It's just a huge assignment. And it's like, well, we talk about like summative and formative assessments and like, don't put something in a summative if it's not truly summative. Well, summatives are like, I don't know, some people refer to it as like the autopsy. Okay. <laughs> like if a formative assessment is like the checkup to see like, are they getting it? then the summative is the autopsy where it's like, we're not doing this anymore. And so it's like, this is what they learned for better or for worse. And we move on from it. And so if like, that's the attitude, then every summative assessment is really, you know, a high stakes test. Mm. Um, but then, I mean, that, that also feeds into some of the like trauma stuff that we're talking about of like, I mean, there are a lot of parents that like lose their mind and are are on, you know, power school or classroom dojo or what you know whatever they've got, uh, like multiple times a day, and mm -hmm. as soon as the kid's getting off the bus, they're getting hit with like, you know, why is this missing? Why are you failing? Why you know? Um, okay. And that's another big change. I think about like when I was in high school, uh, <laughs> I didn't even know what my grade was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Until like you know the six week like progress report came out and my teacher printed it out and handed it to me. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, there's a lot of truth to that. I think back to I my own. My, of, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if my parents knew what my grades were until the end of the year. Cause I used to sign my progress reports myself. Oh, Not see, yeah, no, I, <laughs> I went to the high school my dad taught at. So oh, yeah, you weren't getting away with that. <laughs> no, no. He, like if I, if I, I don't know that I ever really got in trouble cause I watched what happened with my brother, but, um, I yeah, I knew before he, they did. I forgot to get them signed. <laughs> yeah, I, like they, they, I misspoke there. They definitely knew before I knew if I was not doing right. well. <laughs> For sure. But, you know, yeah, if your parents aren't working in that building, it's like, man, they may not, might not even know. Whereas oh, yeah. Now, yeah, parents are tracking that in real time. And I think that really, for a lot of kids, that's an increased stressor. Um and for the parents, too. Yeah, for parents, too. I, I can't imagine from that perspective of just feeling like you're constantly being judged on your parenting skills based on, you know, numbers on on a gradebook app kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, it just it adds to that heightened sense of anxiety and frustration and just feeling constantly like you're being assessed, even even when you're supposed to be living those fun parts of high school. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I don't know, I can't imagine being a teenager today. Sure. Even with things like w with technology and, you know, we try to teach um, uh, like skills for, for being a good human on the internet, like cyber oh, ethics yes. and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but the reality is that like our kids are still figuring it out and sometimes terrible things happen Oh yeah. Via social media. And I think about, you know, I've had kids come in and they're just like terribly distressed over something that's been said or done to them on Instagram or Snapchat or whatever. Mm -hmm. And to be in that position right now where none of the adults in the building understand exactly what they're going through. Yeah. That must be really hard. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I as a therapist and working with teens, um, you know, I try to help parents understand that, like, yeah, for you and I, in our generation, like, unless you were getting bullied by your brother or sister, it mm -hmm. ended when you got off the bus. You know, yeah. once you made it to, you know, home base, it stopped. 
it and that's not the way it is anymore and um you know obviously like horror stories with like you know groups of kids like ganging up and just blowing kids you know facebook or snapchat up with horrible things or you know stuff like that um but then also like the higher prevalence and you know i don't know i'm not well versed enough to really know if like if we have more mental wellness um issues now than we did or if it's just that we're more willing to talk about it <laughs> sure well um, it's kind of the the same as the autism spectrum of like did the sure. you know were the numbers always there and we just didn't call it that or yeah. you know now there's more awareness so it's getting identified sooner yeah right but i think about students you know like they're really going through it and they're bringing that to school and they're taking it home with them every night and mm-hmm. Like you said, it's not just stopping at the end of the school day if it's something like bullying and peer issues and that kind of thing. And I think like that definitely has an impact on the school climate and culture and um, and whatever's impacting students in the building is impacting staff, too. Definitely. Well, and, and yeah, I mean, again, going back to the example of my daughter of, you know, imagine you've got, you know, a uh, classroom of ninth grade English, (laughs) you know, you may have that happening with like multiple kids throughout the day. And you're having to, you know, as a teacher, you have to wear so many hats, you have to be, you know, sometimes you're the nurse, sometimes you're the social worker, sometimes you're the counselor, most times, ideally, you're the teacher, but, you know, sometimes you're the disciplinarian, (laughs) like, you, there's just so many things you have to deal with. Um, and do you find you, you still get, um, from the general public of like, what are you complaining about? You get your summers off or, you know, your, your work day is done at three o'clock or, you know, stuff like that. Yes. I don't know if anyone would say that to my face. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it's definitely like as a teacher, it's really disheartening to see things in the media coming from, you know, everyone from like someone who's clearly an internet troll hiding behind like a fake account, yeah. you know, posting on, on articles all the way up to, you know, people in political office saying like teachers are just indoctrinating students and loser teachers. And that sort of rhetoric I think is really troubling. Um, sure. And, and just downright hurtful. Like, yeah. Uh, I know how hard I work. I know how hard my colleagues work at Lincoln High. I have been so lucky in this role as Teacher of the Year to be able to travel around the state and even the country and see the great work that teachers are doing in, in classrooms. And so any sort of, you know, assertion that teachers aren't aren't doing the best that they can um, and and really doing more with less like we are we are constantly taking money out of our own wallets. Um, but also, you know, stretching a dollar to, yeah. to, to make it happen in the classroom. You know, anything that says otherwise, I think, is the the most dramatic exception to the rule um, that could possibly exist. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm, obviously, you have people that, you know, they're on their way out. They're just biding their time to retire and they've sort of mentally checked out. Um, but by and large, I mean, you're there because you like kids. Mm-hmm. Want, you know, most, I would say, had that like teacher in their own life that inspired them a lot of times of like to to do this work. And clearly, I mean, it's – it's a lot to get the the degree and, you know, go through the praxis and like all the, all the hoops you have to jump through to get your teacher certification and keep it. Um, so yeah, like the idea of like, if they're there, they're, they want to be there. They're not just phoning it in. Um, yeah, because if they don't want to be there, I mean, the research shows like it's a very not, stressful yeah. job. You could go do something else and, and probably have things a little bit easier. <laughs> um, and so I firmly believe like people in a classroom by and large want to be there. And that's not to say there aren't quote unquote bad teachers in existence, sure. but yeah. Um, but to say that, you know, teachers have it easy, they get summers off, which isn't really true. 
<laughs> well, and, and that used to be some of the, <laughs> you know, some of the selling point mm-hmm. of like, yeah, you'll get your summers off, you're done by three, you, you know, or whatever. And um, it's a great, you know, it's, um, you're kind of respected in the community, you make a good wage, um, you know, you have like typically, well, at that time, a lot of times like the, you know, the state funded pension and, and stuff like that. And obviously that's shifted. Um, but it, it, yeah, it doesn't seem to be that anymore. Now I almost hear more the, the other way of like teachers almost like warning other people away. Like, no, you don't want to be a teacher, like do something else kind of like, it's it's awful yeah. it's yeah it's yeah and you know how you say that and i think about like am i guilty of that too um i in in college at uga my roommates and i from from those years we still keep in touch heavily and like do you know little trips together multiple times a year and they are just incredible people and they have these like really awesome careers doing really cool things. Um, but they're mostly like office job kind of things. Yeah. And they can leave it one at the office. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. And, and one of them called me a couple of years ago. Um, and she said, you know, like, I don't know if I love do she's in security system management. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so like, but she like, I mean, she works for a company contracted by Apple. She does like really cool stuff to maintain the security of like the new iPhone and Apple watch and stuff. But she was like, I, I listen to you talk about your kids, your students. And it just, it feels like the work that you do every day really matters. And I don't know if what I'm doing really matters. Mm. And I feel that way. I'm thinking about like, maybe, maybe, maybe I should go back to school and I should become a teacher. And I was like, no, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and, and, and in that moment, it's not that I don't think that she would be a great teacher, but I was like, I, I spend so many nights coming home and just absolutely in anguish over stuff going on with my students that I can't fix for them. Like people talk about like hard parts of teaching, like, Oh, angry parents and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, grading and, you know, the workload outside of class time and plan time and low pay scale and that kind of stuff. And like, yes, all of those things are important for sure. But to me, the hardest part of teaching is when I come home at night and I know that I have kids who are not going to a place that's warm. They're not going to a place where they feel loved. Mm. They, they don't have a bed to sleep in. And there's nothing I can do about that. Yeah. You know, like, that's the hard part of teaching. And I don't, I, like, I mean, like, I love what I do every day. I don't wish that feeling on anyone. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's, I mean, obviously the, the whole concept of like the upside down kingdom of like, you know, how is it that teachers and social workers are making what they make and like some of these other people are making what they make. And, um, but also the, um, yeah, just the, um, being bombarded with that on like on a daily basis, and do you, do you find grad programs are starting to teach to that of like, are they having classes on coping skills and like, you know, I think so. how to I take care of teachers? <laughs> You're listening to OTC episode 47 with Sydney Jensen, the 2019 Nebraska Teacher of the Year. We'll be right back after a brief word from our sponsor. Would you like to talk to a counselor but can't find the time? Would you rather talk to someone from the comfort of your own home? If so, Parenting and Family Solutions is here to help. We now offer teletherapy to all clients who reside in the state of Pennsylvania. Using our secure portal, you can have a video session with your counselor using a laptop, desktop computer, or smartphone. Visit our website to learn more at www.parentfamilysolutions.com or give us a call at 717 602 
888-888-5560 to see if teletherapy might be a good fit for you. Let us help you build a stronger family and a healthier you. Do you find grad programs are starting to teach to that of like, are they having classes on coping skills and like, you know, I think so. how to I, take care of teachers? <laughs> for sure. And, and I don't know, you know, I'm not like, I'm not the expert by any means, but I think that uh, there are really no one knows where to start. And so we hear, you know, lots of like self-care is important. You've got to take care of yourself. But I don't know that people have really figured out a definition for that. And so a lot of articles I read about like teacher self-care and, and wellness, it's like, go get a manicure, treat yourself. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I, and that, that's what I was going to ask is great, it, but. <laughs> so, so often it's that like tongue in cheek, you know, the, you have like the, um, the teacher in service on, you know, self-care and wellness and secondhand trauma and burnout. And it's like, mm -hmm. you need to take care of yourself. But at the same time, out the other side of the mouth, it's like, we got to raise these, these test scores. Like the, you know, the state's going to come in here and take us over. And most of the teachers are like, yeah, that's great. When the heck am I going to do that? Like, uh, yeah. Thanks so much for telling me what I already know. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, that's very nice of you. Um, yeah, and so then I think it comes down to, like, you know, what are the things that are going to do both? Um, you know, for me, like, I, I really see value, and I think it's, like, probably one of the most important things that teachers can do for themselves, especially new teachers, is, like, you've got to be able to find your people within your building. Mm. Um, because teaching can be super lonely, uh, you know, to be in a room full of kids all day and to still feel lonely is like pretty heavy stuff. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, alone in a crowded room is, is re yeah. very real. But traditionally, the way that teaching has looked like in the United States is like one adult, you know, 20 to 30 kids and you shut the door. Um, and so teaching is something that we do in silos privately and I think back to like, especially my first couple of years teaching and there was this like huge fear of being kind of found out, you know, that things weren't always going well. <laughs> yeah. And They're going to can me the yeah, imposter syndrome. Yeah. For sure. And a big part of that was that I had no idea what was going on in everybody else's classroom. And so it was easy to like that, you know, mean voice in my head to say, it's just you. Everyone else has it figured out. Ah, uh, Yes. And that's obviously not true. Mm -hmm. Like everybody is struggling, you know, with different aspects, you know, of what it, what it looks like in a classroom. And the more that we both, I think, literally and figuratively open our doors, <laughs> I think the better off we are. Um, okay. But then and there's less of that, you know, singular and, and solitary sort of aspect to it. And so, yeah, it was my, um, my fourth year teaching a new teacher came to our building and was next door and we just decided we were going to have an open door policy and hmm. yeah, like you come in my room whenever I'll come in your room whenever we'll observe each other, but it's not anything like real. I mean, it's just like, we're just going to watch each other and ask questions and share resources and really lean into it and not just be like, you know, yeah, come by anytime. <laughs> like we really did it. Well, and, so for you, I mean, you took that upon yourself to to yeah. do, you know, mentorship and accountability um, and, you know, support each other. Do you find that's being done throughout school districts where they're like putting that in place automatically of like you here, here is your mentor teacher. You know, you're new. Here's somebody that's veteran. Like you need you need to work together. I think it's a Your little face said no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. So I think that a lot of districts try it. Um, I they, don't. They have know good intentions. How... Yes, yeah, there are great intentions behind it. So so much of it is personality matching. Okay. And you know when it's when it's 
one person for a building say, being told like, hey, you're going to match people up with a mentor and they've got 80,000 other things on their plate. They're sure. just throwing people together. Like, yeah. You know? And again, going back to the like, great, so I'm supposed to do self-care, but you're giving me a mentor to <laughs> like. That I don't maybe vibe with or like, yeah. And so I think like 99% of why it was effective for me and Haley was that it was just totally genuine yeah. and Organic. authentic. Yeah. yeah, it was organic. No one was coming to us saying like, you're going to be partners. You're going to watch each other. It was just like, to be honest, she started at Lincoln High and it was a hot mess and I could hear it through the wall. <laughs> okay. And like, yeah. And you're I like, was like, oh, oh girl. <laughs> yes. I, I teach, we teach in a hundred year old building. Like, okay. the walls are <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there was a day I was in the middle of my lesson with my ninth graders and you could just hear next door, like the train was off the tracks. And I, I was terrible. I, in that moment, I was so judgmental. I remember I stopped talking and I closed my eyes for a second and I just took a deep breath and all my kids just stared at me. And one of my ninth graders is the one who he looked up and he said, he was like, Miss Jensen, it sounds like she needs some help. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you are so right. Out You're of the mouth of babes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so after school that day that's when it started it was like hey i it sounds like you could use some help i'm here i have you know stuff going on that's like not working out great either let's see what we can do to help each other mm -hmm. and yeah it was just that like organic piece but also like we really get we get along and now she's you know my teacher best friend she watches mm -hmm. the bachelor at my house every week <laughs> like, <laughs> whole thing there yeah. And I think like, like that's the thing that makes a difference, but a lot of districts are doing that. It's just that it's not organic mm -hmm. and, or also <laughs> it falls apart after a uh, couple of years. Yeah. Okay. And so it doesn't last. Yeah. It's that, that myth that only new teachers need help. Sure. And that's not really accurate. <laughs> Clearly. And so, yeah. you know, as a first, second, maybe third year teacher, you get tons of supports in terms of like that assigned mentor, weekly check ins with someone or, you know, we do new teacher meetings hmm. um, in our district. And then all of that goes away. You know, mm, yeah. a lot of it goes away after year one. Everything is gone after year three. And sure. the idea that teachers just no longer need that sort of support and community Laughable. after a couple of years is just like, I'm not buying it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, to go back to that, would you say, I mean, I know it's, you said like more money, which nobody wants to hear and, mm -hmm. you know, more resources, um, almost like doing you know, Myers-Briggs or DISC profiles to like match people sure. together better. Um, and then making sure that it, okay, it goes beyond year one or year three or, or things like that. Um, are there... Myers-Briggs is the thing. I think that sometimes we, we want to get everything in place too quickly, yeah. if that makes sense. And so we can't decide who someone's mentor is going to be when we haven't met them. Okay. It's um, like freshman roommates so, in college. Like, <laughs> Yeah. And that often doesn't work out. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, like I think, you know, sure. Assign someone who's going to be their point person week one, you know, to tell them like, here's where the copier is. Here's how you get like logged into this, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but then letting it be a little more organic where it's like, all right, after week one, you've spent some time talking to people and getting to know a few people like who would be a good person for you that you could partner with. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about like my assigned mentor and my assigned person when I first started, we did not, we, I don't know if we were existing on the same planet necessarily. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's not that they weren't a great person. It's just our teaching style. Yeah. yeah. We were just totally different personalities. And so things that worked in her classroom didn't necessarily translate over to mine in a way that was tangible as a first year teacher who doesn't have a lot of tools yet. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And so I, I don't know that that experience was really helpful. Mm. It felt like one more thing, sure. you know? And would you uh, – any advice you'd give to teachers of 
uh, like, would you say, like, stay away from uh, teacher lounges of, like, um, you know, a lot of times you hear of that, like, it's just, it's it's breeding ground for gossip, and um, it's so negative a lot of times. Um, Yeah, I I don't know if you would give any advice like that or any other things. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Do you, if you are a person who's into Jennifer Gonzalez, Cult of Pedagogy, Mm -hmm. Um, she actually has a really interesting blog post about this. Um, I think it's called finding your marigold. Hmm. And so in it, she talks about, I'm not a gardener. Like I pretend to garden and then I throw (laughs) dirt and then I have a thousand zucchinis. Uh, (laughs) They they do like to run. (laughs) Yeah. But real gardeners, um, apparently know that there is something chemically positive that happens if you plant your vegetable garden, your marigolds, Mm -hmm. Um, there's something that happens where like, you're more likely to produce a higher yield. Yeah. You didn't know that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But the opposite happens. If you plant your vegetables near a walnut tree, Mm, Um, you're like far less likely to grow anything at all. And so she sort of equates that to people in a, in a school, how like some people are marigolds, you should plant yourself near them because they're going to help you grow and they're going to be positive and, and fun to be around. And there are also people in every building who are walnut trees. Mm -hmm. They will will stifle you. They will pick out everything negative to complain about. Mm -hmm. Um, And you have to really be able to identify both so that you know who to go to and who to stay away from. Wow. Uh, For any teachers or budding teachers that are listening, like, let that sink in because that was yeah. huge. Um, it made me think of the the book, The Energy Bus, and the For idea sure. of like energy vampires of like mm-hmm. they just suck you dry. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, if I'm honest with myself, like I really I try to be a marigold every day. I have my moment. Sure. Where I'm for sure a walnut tree. And, you know, the more that we check ourselves on that, I think the the more spaces like a staff lounge can be really positive places for community. Mm -hmm. But it's when those walnut trees take over it and they're just sucking people in, you know, to stew in the sadness with them. Yeah. Well, and like you were saying, you know, in with Haley and seeking her out, like obviously seeing a need or hearing a need (laughs) and, and then connecting, um, you're then able to to go through some of like the primary trauma stuff of like, oh, my marriage just ended or like my dad died or, you know, stuff like that. But you have to like really, you know, build up the base, I guess I would say, to, to even get to those points. Absolutely. It's that that selective vulnerability, mm-hmm. um, that idea that like, you know, especially right away when we meet people, we're not necessarily willing to, you know, share our whole life story with them. Um, but to be able to build relationships with people, we have to be able to choose pieces of ourselves to share with, whether it's our students or our colleagues, you know, stories from our childhood, successes, failures, because those are the things that like help us humanize ourselves to those people to mm-hmm. be able to build relationships. Sure. Um and if we don't have that, then there's no positive culture or comfortable culture in, you know, our building, um, but even in our classroom. And like, I think without that kind of stuff, nobody's willing to take a risk. Sure. And that's like that important space where learning happens, whether it's for students or for adults. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and- so so many yeah so many different directions <laughs> there's like so many rabbit holes um in terms of um you know mental health mental wellness for teachers i mean would you just say like mandatory sessions like therapy sessions across the board or like um e- you know everyone's got to access their eap at least once a year or <laughs> like <laughs> You know, like, honestly, I think that would be really cool if it were something like that in terms of just a check-in. Um, I I don't even know if it's that. I think it's just access because so many teachers, you know, in, in big districts, but especially in small districts, they don't even have the access to that 
mm-hmm. uh, support. And I think when it's something that's offered, people are more likely to use it. Okay. And the more that we talk about it, I think the more people are going to be willing to use it. My district, you know, it's part of our employment plan. Like we have access to uh, a few free um, counseling sessions each year. Mm -hmm. And when they first started doing that, you know, the thing was like, well, is it truly anonymous? Can I, can I do this? Ah, yes. And know that there's not going to be some backlash in my, in my personnel file, that kind of thing. And, and so that's one of those things that like, it just has to be a movement of vulnerability and trust. Mm -hmm. And the more that we talk about it and normalize it, the better off everybody's going to be for it. Yeah. And, uh, I guess I would say from, from the counselor end of the couch to any teachers listening, like, yes, uh, at least, uh, with me, I can speak to that of like, it is completely confidential. Like I'm, I, uh, a little bit selfish, but I usually say like, you're not worth me losing my license over. <laughs> like <laughs> I worked kind of hard to get it and I like it. I like what I do. Um, and in addition to the, that's the way it's supposed to be. It is supposed to be confidential unless, you know, you hit some of those like mandated reporting kind of stuff. But I mean, your teachers know that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've talked about, um, you know, mentorship and accountability, uh, we, you know, we touched here on the, you know, EAP sessions and things like that. Are there other things aside from, you know, manicures and, and the bachelorette or things like that, that, <laughs> um, help promote mental wellness for teachers? For sure. Um, you know, I think like, to me, the biggest thing is just that, that community piece that you have to feel connected to other people. Um, whether it's, you know, people in your apartment, people across the building, um, building a life for yourself outside of school, I think is something that, uh, you know, a lot of times we decide like, you're only a good teacher if you stay until nine o'clock at night. And in my opinion, like that doesn't make you a good teacher. It makes you a tired one. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you can't find yourself in this position where your entire life is at school. Um, cause that I think in a lot of ways is really unhealthy, Um, but also just like allowing yourself to feel those feelings, you know, there's research on like that, that sort of cycle you go through at school, Mm -hmm. um, throughout the school year and February we're like (laughs) solidly in disillusionment. (laughs) Um, I read this really just like, I mean, it resonates. It really does. (laughs) It's, uh, the, the title of it, it's called Hey New Teachers. It's okay to cry in your car. (laughs) Wow. Um, Okay. I think it applies to all teachers, not just new ones. Sure. (laughs) But it talks about that feeling in February when like you haven't seen the sun in what feels like 17 years and, um, you're just having a really hard time. And, and it uses this example of a teacher who thought to themselves, well, what if I like slip on the ice in the parking lot and break my leg? At least I'll get three weeks off. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, it's easy to, like, hear that and kind of chuckle and laugh. But, like, that's a real feeling um, to to get to that point when you feel like, man, it's so late in the year. Why am I still struggling with classroom management? Why is this thing still not going well? You know, teachers, I think we are soul workers and, and counselors, too. And we're super hard on ourselves when we make a mistake. No. You know, like... It, yeah, right. <laughs> like the hundredth day of school and you call a kid by the wrong name uh-huh. and it eats away at you for the next eight months. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we are our harshest critics in a lot of ways. And I think like we have to give ourselves space to feel those feelings, but also create space to give ourselves some grace. Mm hmm. Whether that is through things like exercise or watching The Bachelorette or, you know, building, you know, positive relationships with other people in the building Um, or if it's going to counseling or journaling or I don't know, like I started playing acoustic guitar about a year and a half ago because to be honest, I was having a really hard time and I just needed something that was like calming and, Mm -hmm. and an outlet. And that's been really positive for me. And 
but but we have to prioritize those aspects to our own mental wellness because if we're not doing that we're honestly hurting kids Mm -hmm. and that's the other like that's the other important thing is like there's real research um uh, about that as well i read a in that same book about mindfulness um there was a study they did uh where they looked at stress hormones um across i think they said 400 elementary and middle schools um and they found that uh teacher the teachers with the higher rate of the stress hormone cortisol um also had students who had the higher rate of the stress hormone cortisol Mm. and so when we're stressed out as teachers in front of a classroom that is directly impacting the stress of our students. And so it's sure. not just for us that we need to practice self-care. It's also for the benefit of the kids that we serve and that we love so much. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously the, you know, just how strong modeling is and, you know, clearly, you know, especially elementary school, I mean, they're not even like they're barely even a third of the way through fully forming their brain and their neural pathways and, just picking all of that that negative emotion up like sponges, um, yeah, I could I could co- totally see where that would that would be a huge impact. And like like we were saying, the um, it's you know kind of that like uh, the best offense is a good defense or vice versa kind of concept of like um, you know if you're taking care of yourself, you're you're better able to take care of somebody else you know uh, the other cliche is the um putting the oxygen mask on yourself first kind of kind of idea yeah. hmm. okay. absolutely so i i, I did want to hit um i have a, a couple of listener questions that came in um i I'd, I'd wanted to go through those a little bit so uh, um there was one question from uh, it's at Heathery ish uh, on Instagram, and she talks about um, you know how do we change the mindset of an education system that seems to be more focused on valuing teachers based on their students' test scores as opposed to the connection that they have with their students, and and how do we make a dent in that? Yeah, for sure. I think the first thing is like um, I'm always an advocate for more teachers to be, uh, sitting at the policy table. Um, Mm -hmm. and so I think like part of that, when we talk about educational systems, a lot of times that is referring to people who are sitting in seats they were elected to. And so prioritizing your vote towards people who value teachers and value public education, I think is kind of step one. Um, the other thing is like, uh, as a teacher being really vulnerable and telling your story, um, uh, there's a thing called tiny teaching stories where I think it's through ed week. Um, if you Google it, uh, it comes right up and you can submit, um, your tiny teaching story, little moments from your classroom that emphasize that value of connection. Um, hmm. rather than like, I, 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 I pretty much bet money that nobody is writing a tiny teaching story about how like, you know, their students' state testing scores really, really Tanked made and... awesome, you know, like, uh, and so I think, like, teachers can really, you know, drive the narrative um, by being intentional and, and talking about those things. Um, and I think, like, we're, we're moving in an interesting direction when institutions of higher learning are saying, we don't care about the GRE, we don't care about SAT scores. Mm. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see the impact that that continues to have as colleges start to say, like, this isn't giving us the information we want about students. There has to be something else. And would you also say um, parents sort of bang in that oh, drum as well? For sure. Mm-hmm. For sure. I think when when parents are out celebrating teachers, you know, who are making an impact on their student um, and they're the ones focusing on that connection piece and, you know, the, the actual learning that takes place in a classroom and, and look at the growth that my students experienced as a result of, of their time spent in, in this space. Mm-hmm. I think that's the other thing. Um, but mostly like teachers, 
you know, we just have to come together to celebrate our profession because if, if people in political office aren't doing that, um, then the onus falls on, on us as a profession and on, on parents, Mm -hmm. um, who are hopefully more than satisfied, uh, with the work that we're doing in our classrooms. Sure. Nice. And, and then, uh, another question that came in, uh, was from Amy that, uh, talks about, um, you know, how can teachers cope with just so many students coming to school with trauma? You know, many teachers, they, they take it home with them and they, you know, experience loss of sleep and mental health issues as a result of taking that, that stuff home. Any, any wisdom you could speak to that? You know, I, <laughs> I hope so. Um, uh, you know, we operate in, in this world of trying to be like a harm reductionist. Mm. Our kids walk in and they carry so much pain in so many different ways. And we can't take the harm away, but we can hopefully reduce its impact. And I think we have to be doing the same thing for ourselves. Um, and so prioritizing making space for yourself. Whether it's, you know, I take my dog on a walk every day with my husband and I really unload on him all the things <laughs> that I'm carrying from school that day. And he is such a great listener and gives really good, actionable feedback. Okay. Um, except for those times when I'm like, can we just adopt them? The answer is always no. So. <laughs> As it, yeah, it probably should be. Yeah. All right. All right. You know, um, uh, but yeah, and I think just like continue reminding ourselves that we're doing the best we can with what we have. I think like, you know, when I'm working with kids who are who are bringing elements of trauma to school with them every day, figuring out and connecting with like our counseling staff who mm -hmm. at Lincoln High, they're just so amazing. Like, I don't know how we get so lucky to teach the best kids in the world and also have the best counselors in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, we're just really hitting the, hitting the lottery on that. And I find myself every day leaning on them more and more to help connect our kids with, you know, resources in the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when I can come home and think to myself like, yeah, this kid has a lot going on, but I know that I'm working to get them connected to things that can hopefully help. I think that that eases that burden a lot mm -hmm. because we're sharing, we're sharing it as a staff. It's not, it's never just me. It's me and their other teachers and their counselor and their administrator. Mm -hmm. And we're all working together collectively. And so the hope is that every building has that sort of camaraderie and that sense of like, I don't know, collective efficacy that like, if I can't do it myself, someone else in this building can. Um, and so I hope that that's true in other places. Yeah. I, I, I thought that was so, so well said. I mean, it made me think of, um, you know, just a SAP referral and like, you know, the importance of the team working together, but also within the community, you know, it's, it's on me as the counselor also to reach out to the school counselor or to the teacher and, find out and coordinate of like, Hey, this is what I'm dealing with in the counseling office. What are you dealing with in the classroom? And, um, you know, through making some of those connections, also the potential benefit of, you know, that teacher possibly coming to services, maybe not with me, but like, you know, just, Hey, maybe it'd be a good idea to talk to somebody. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just the importance of that that network uh, within the school, but also within the community. I would say, any um, I don't know any any tips that you would give to you know any administration, any teacher that's listening that they're like, we don't really seem to have that community uh, within the school or the school district. How do you create it? Yeah. So some things that. Um that uh, we've done at Lincoln High, but that I've also like heard from other other schools, other people. Um, I think that there are things that you can do on the individual level, whether it's like, you know, making it your mission that you're going to write like, you know, five kind notes or emails or whatever to colleagues, just like communicating. Uh, 
the Mr. See Thank them. You project. <laughs> yeah, you see them and you appreciate them and you like notice how hard they work. Um, cause in a lot of ways, teaching sometimes can feel very thankless. <laughs> sure. Let um, me, uh, I'm going to interrupt you just for a second to sure. plug my buddy, uh, John Israel, uh, the Mr. Sure. Thank You project. Uh, if you have not checked out that book, he basically does that where he like, he writes five thank you notes a day for a year. And, and sort of writes about it. So, yeah, that, I think that's a, a great way to connect. Awesome. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. I'm writing it down so I can, <laughs> I can look at it later. Um, that's so cool. So that's something that's, you know, that's zero dollars. And that's something that you don't have to organize a bunch of people to do it. You can just do it on your own, mm -hmm. which I think is great. Um, I've also seen where, like, departments organize, like, you know, every – every Thursday we're going to eat lunch all together and we're going to create space to have like, you know, tough conversations, conversations for that, like selective vulnerability, just to get to know each other better and build those relationships with each other. Um, have people to lean on. Uh, some schools do, they call it wellness Wednesday, which I think is really mm. cute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's nice alliteration so there. <laughs> yeah. Sco middle school here in Lincoln. They have just like this slamming mission Monday or, um, uh, wellness Wednesday thing that they do where, you know, it's like, if you participate in any aspect of wellness Wednesday, you get to wear like sweatpants to school, which I think is just <laughs> a really nice pick me up for people. Um, but they do like sponsored, like go on a walk with a colleague during, uh, your plan period around the neighborhood. Um, uh, they do things where, you know, it's like they'll have people come in to teach like a little art lesson during the lunch periods and you can come in and do some art during lunch. Um, they do mindfulness practices and we're doing that at Lincoln high this year as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, inviting in like community yoga teachers. I think we underutilize the things in our community that would be willing to help out with stuff like this. Sure. Whether, it, you know, the parents of some of our students, you know, who would be more than happy to come and lead something, um, you know, in their wheelhouse for teachers, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Um, we've started at Lincoln High on Friday afternoons after school. Somebody comes in and teaches a Zumba class and they're just doing that, you know, pro bono mm -hmm. on behalf of like being thankful for the, the work that teachers are doing at Lincoln High. Mm. And I think that's really cool. Um, yeah, there's different things that are like different variables of commitment and that kind of stuff. Um, but I think the biggest thing is like more than anything else, teachers want to feel supported. <laughs> yeah. And, and so from the administrative perspective, a really easy thing to do is to just make time to listen. Okay. I think. Nothing drives me crazier than when an administrator walks by me in the hall and they say, hey, how's it going? But they keep walking. Mm, sure. You know? Why ask if you're not going to? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I know like everybody has a million things on their plate. But mm -hmm. but if we stop and we listen to each other, I think that makes such a big impact. And it costs zero dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, um that idea of like the speed of trust and the, mm -hmm. the vulnerability, like, you know, it's this sort of symbiotic, you know, me getting outside of my comfort zone at the same time you're doing the same thing and, and, um, trying to find, you know, it doesn't always have to be big dollars or, or big extravagant things that you're doing. Like you said, just can be post-it notes, can be, you know, small things like, um, you know, a lot of some school districts will will do some of these like online challenges or things like that, where they create videos or music videos or things like that. And and I, I definitely think the the humor side of it and like some of the silliness is a is a huge part of it. Um, I know from my training with um, uh, secondary trauma and PTSD and compassion fatigue and things like that. I mean, one of the things they say is like your sense of humor is usually one of the first things to go. Like mm -hmm. you, you just, you actually are more irritable and like grouchy and, you know, stuff that you used to find funny is not anymore. And that's mm -hmm. kind of one of the first signs a lot of times. Um, hmm. Wow. 
So any um, any parting advice that you would give to either grad students or <laughs> college students or, yeah, first-year teachers, veteran teachers? Yeah. If you, yeah. If you were, you know, head of, you know, Department of Education for the entire, you know, country, what would you – no pressure – Sure. Um, so if I'm in charge, the first thing is uh, please call people, um, call your representatives and your senators uh, and encourage them to be in support of the Teacher Health and Wellness Act, that H.R. 2544. Um, so that's my first plug just for some, you know, some actionable steps. <laughs> yes. And I, I will make sure to link to that in the show yeah. notes. So, yeah. Um, and then the second one, I think, is. Uh, to get out of your own space and, and go and reach out to other people, whether it's the person next door to you, the person down the hall, the person on the other end of the building. Um, because I really do think that like the key is in connections mm. and the more you're building a community for yourself inside of your school, the happier you're going to be, the more supported you're going to feel. Um, and you know, the bigger that village becomes, that I think every teacher needs to be successful and to be happy um, and to avoid those elements of, of burnout and compassion fatigue uh, and secondary trauma. And, and even if you're not avoiding them, at, at least to address them um, proactively. And would you say the onus kind of falls on the individual teacher to like sort of build that for themselves for the most part? No, mm -hmm. not necessarily. I think the onus is shared. Sure. <laughs> I think, like, yeah, I think it's a, a shared responsibility. Um, you know, like we talked about, some districts, some buildings are doing it better than others and have it systematic, uh, whether it's, you know, working great or not working at all or anywhere in between. Um, but if, if you see that something is lacking that you need, then I think you owe it to yourself and the effort you've put into becoming a teacher, um, you know, to have that sort of like moment of courage to go and reach out to someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're a person who's been in teaching a while and you've sort of got this thing figured out, you know, you owe it to your former first year teacher self who needed that. Yes. To go down the hall and to knock on that door and to reach out to people and make sure that everyone is, is feeling that connection. Definitely. Mm. And, uh, Sydney, thank you so much for, for being willing to be on the show. Uh, I've had a, a great time talking with you uh, again. Uh, there's so many, so many different rabbit holes we could have gone down and I'd, I'd love to have you back on at some point, uh, to just kind of follow up with you, but, um, sure. so thrilled that you're out there speaking to this. Cause obviously it's a huge need. Um, and, you know, that, that idea of when, when teachers aren't able to take care of themselves or they stop learning, then the, like, how can we expect our kids to, to learn or, or take care of themselves if it's not being modeled to them? And yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So where can people find you? Yeah, if they want to find your social media stuff or they want to get in touch with you or, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm on Twitter. I love Twitter. So you can find me there at Sydney C. Jensen. Um, I'm also, uh, I've got a website going. And so I list out everywhere that I'll be doing things if, if you want to come hang um, and learn together. And so that's uh, sydney-jensen.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram at love miss Jensen. And so feel free to connect with me on any of those. Um, I love building that professional learning network. Awesome. Man. Well, yeah, again, uh, thank you so much. So, uh, I will, uh, l definitely stay in touch with you and, um, look forward to hopefully having you back on at some point. So take care. Take care. Sounds good. Well, that wraps up episode 47. Thank you for stopping by and checking it out. So just to, to recap, um, 
again, th- this year uh, is going to bring a lot of challenges, uh, a lot of opportunities for, for growth and learning, but a heck of a lot of challenges. And we all need each other. Um, and we need teachers and administrators. And just the importance for all of us in terms of our mental health and our emotional well-being, our self-care, and also our support of others. But especially for, for teachers heading into this school year, um, they're, they're going to need this. They're, they're going to need um, to learn how to take care of themselves if they don't already know, or they're going to, to need to, to really focus on that intentionally more, the, so than they've, more so than they've had to in the past. Um, and so for, for any teachers or administrators out there, I, I think what I want to leave you with is, is the knowledge that we, we see you, we hear you, we support you. And thank you so much for the work that you're doing, for the love and the care that you have for our kids. And I know a lot of teachers, um, they, they don't view them as students. They view them as like my kids. They're, they're mine. And, and yeah, I, I, I guess I just want uh, any teacher or administrator to know that we know that this is a hard job. It's very thankless, um, and you're being asked to make really, really tough decisions uh, and trying to do the best that you can. And I, I hope that you're able to take something from this to be able to, to focus on your own mental health and well-being uh, throughout the year and, and beyond, clearly. But um, like I said, especially uh, where we're headed over the next few months. Next episode will be OTC episode 48, where I sit down with my business partner and co-owner, Jason Bose, to talk about the parenting side of the coin for the coming school year. Thank you and good night. Well, if you liked what you heard, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you're catching this podcast. You can check out detailed show notes and any other resources given in the show at www.pfsonthecouch.com. If you'd like to stay up to date on upcoming episodes, guests, or contribute questions to the show, be sure to follow along on any of your favorite social media platforms. The author and host of this podcast is not engaged in a therapeutic relationship with the listener and cannot give counseling advice without a confidential appointment. Listeners should be sure to consult with a licensed therapist in their area or seek emergency medical attention if they are experiencing psychological difficulty. A special thanks to the band The Topsy Turvies for the show theme song. Their song, Like a Living Dead, can be found at topsyturvies.bandcamp.com. The bump interview track was the song 1973 by Bruno E. The author and host of this podcast is John Dennis. Special thanks to show editor Casey Lehman and show producer Trevor Groff.